Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. All right. All of our guests today, including including Ian McIntyre, standing by. It's Monday. Sponsored by Passant Motors. Celebrate Father's Day all month long with some amazing deals. Visit their showroom in Surrey, home of Morgan Creek, where you celebrated Father's Day without your children. <laughs> They're not in town. Or shop online at Passant Motors, B-A-S-A-N-T Motors dot com. So much uh, uh, response to Laney's OK Tire oh, Langley uh, hop it, hop it. regarding the OEL trade and other matters. Uh, is it just me? A reminder coming up in the next hour around, uh, what, 1145, 1140 or so. Uh, joining us now from Sportsnet, sportsnet.ca, Ian McIntyre to talk about OEL. Ian, thanks for doing this, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Nice to be on with you guys again. And just so I understand this, Rick, your kids left town so they wouldn't have to celebrate Father's Day with you. <laughs> no, nah, they're, they're 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 at a stag in uh, Vegas. Oh. I have no I I had no choice in that. You yeah, you can't compete with that. But plus, Father's Day on a Sunday and on a U.S. Open day, are any of us doing anything other than just sitting in front of the TV? Thank you, no. thank you, uh, thank you. Bang on, bang thank on. You. Thank you. Okay, Ian, let's get right to it. Uh, I think you use the word sensible in your uh, in your column, but just your opinion of the Canucks decision to buy out Oliver Ekman Larson? Well, the the best of, of some bad options. I, I think that the shock and, and especially some of the reaction initially when when this news came down on Friday, I, I think is it just the fact that the Canucks were actually willing to do this, that they're willing to buy out a guy who's got four years and 33 million left uh, on his contract because it's a massive, massive hit. It's one of the fifth largest buyout in league history. It's just a, a massive amount of money. But what it what it says to me is is it highlights the inability of uh, Rutherford and Patrick Alvine to to find uh, other strategies to ease their salary cap. You know, they've been talking since they came about trying to move bad contracts. And this isn't unique to this market. It's just so hard to move bad contracts. And I'm not even talking about the OEL one because that one was always going to be untradeable. But, you know, they talked about Connor uh, Garland and they talked about Brock Besser. Um, we know that Tyler Myers is an anchor right now on, on this team's salary cap. And I think it reflects that having exhausted uh, a lot of trade options or gone through a lot of discussions on what else they could do, this is what the Canucks are left with. Uh, and, you know, if you if you can get by the massive number, and it's a hard number to, yeah. to get past the amount of this buyout, it is such a, a sensible thing to do based on his value to the team versus his cost on on the salary cap. And especially when you look at the next two years, because that's when the Canucks, of course, are going to have the most benefit, almost $12 million in savings in the next two seasons, $7.1 million alone. That's massive for a team that was under the salary cap vice and really was going to be unable to do anything to improve this team unless they found a way to create some cap space. So they found that way. You know, years three and four, it, it's going to be a big hit on the cap, four, almost $4.8 million. But let's remember as well, three years from now, the salary cap might be $100 yep. million. Dollars. Yeah. And who knows what it is in years five, six, seven, maybe by the end of this buyout, uh, um, it's going to be, you know, $120 million. So I, I don't think... You never want to have that clutter at the bottom of your salary cap. Every dollar counts. You don't want to have dead money. But in the latter years of this buyout, I don't think $2 million in this in this scheme of things and where the salary cap is going to be is going to be debilitating. But certainly years three and four are costly, but they're going to have a huge benefit in years one and two. Yeah, we did mention that in the uh, first segment about the, uh, you know, the very real possibility of the uh, – salary cap increasing. I don't know if you heard uh, my story about uh, 2015 and the family's visit down to uh, Arizona, how OEL was just the best player on the ice in two games uh, we saw 
uh, with with the Coyotes. He's 31. Ian, what, what happened to his yeah. game? What happened to his game? Well, I, I hope he can come back. Uh, he he recognized last season that he just wasn't playing well enough, and he and he kind of revealed to us at the end of the season. I wish I'd known more about it during the season, <laughs> but at the end of the season, he revealed how much he was set back by that broken bone he suffered at the 2022 World Championships. He wasn't able to to really train. Certainly couldn't skate until August. You know, guys are skating now in May. If your team's out in April, you're skating in May and June. Yep. Uh, and so he didn't get started to August, and he he lost a step he couldn't afford to lose. It was that simple. You know, there's. Uh, I still think if he can get that step back, he's probably going to be a bargain for somebody on a one year deal at one point five million because at age thirty one he should still be able to play. But he just lost a step. So much of his game, guys, was his mobility. And uh, you know, to your to your story, Donnie, about twenty fifteen, I, I had one of my colleagues uh, that I, I saw at the Stanley Cup said he had a place uh, in in uh, Scottsdale yeah. and the only reason the only reason to go to the Coyote games some nights was to see Oliver Ekman Larson because he was such a wonderful defenseman so hmm. fluid you know had uh, you know skill and speed and could defend I don't think we're going to see that Oliver Ekman Larson again but I certainly think that he can still play in this league if, if, if he can get that step back this summer. And I, I guess partly why I felt badly for him. Uh, I love that guys are accountable and, and I love that they can, they can self assess even when the result might not be what they want to, to have. Like he, he was very pragmatic. He understood he had to be better. And to that end, uh, I think, you know, I'm I'm led to believe he spent extra time in Vancouver after the season. He continued, he stayed here to continue rehabbing and working with the training staff because he was so determined that he needed to be better and he was going to be better next season. I hope he is, but obviously it's going to be for somebody else. Ian, Canuck defensemen are uh, dropping like flies here. Ethan Bear, six months sh- uh, shoulder surgery. Um, he's also got to be qualified. He's up in his contract. Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen with Ethan Bear? Uh, I, I think he'll be qualified. Uh, I said last week, and, and I stand to be wrong, as I you, go, you guys know I often am. But if you believe in a player, and if you think he's part of your future, you're not going to write him off because he's unavailable for three months at, at the start of the season. Right. Right. So I, I think I think they absolutely. Uh, I liked what Ethan Baird did last year. I think the Canucks liked what Ethan Baird did last year. Let's remember, though, Patrick Alvin said at his year end press conference he liked Ethan Baird as well, but you know, quote unquote, wasn't sure he deserves a raise. So they'd been talking a long time. Uh, this kind of derails, I think, whatever leverage uh, Ethan Baird had. I hope that the Canucks qualify him because I think he can be uh, an important part of of their defense. Now, whether ultimately that means he's a he's a really good third pairing guy, whether he's a second pairing guy, which is what he is right now for this team, whether he can continue to do that, who knows? But I think he can definitely play in this league. I thought he came to Vancouver with a great attitude. He knew that he had to reestablish himself, which is what he did. Uh, with the Canucks after after falling out of favor in Carolina. So I, I think he should still be part of this team. We know that they have so little coming, guys, right? It would be different if, if they were just, if the pipeline was clogged with blue chip defensemen coming this way, but that's just not the case. The organization, especially in the last year, I think did a, did a, a good job, Alvin and his staff did a really good job of adding some depth we saw their development successes with, with Brisebois and Wolanin. I think those guys can play on your third pair, mm. but they have no second pairing right now. I think Ethan Bear, were he healthy, would be part of that second pair. They just have to make room for him to come back in December. Ian, you just covered the Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, when you watch the Stanley Cup Finals and then you watch the Canucks all year long, boy, oh boy, how far do they got to go to reach that level in your eyes? Yeah, well, that's an elite level, right? You're talking about the best team out of 32 and, and the Golden Knights. What a story. What a job by uh, George McPhee, who, of course, started here in Vancouver under Pat Quinn and, and Kelly McCrimmon to build that team and make a lot of decisions that were unpopular. I was, I was musing 
with one of my colleagues there. Can you imagine in a market like, you know, Vancouver or Toronto, like if you if you decided Mark Andre Fleury, mm. beloved fan, fan favorite, your number one goalie isn't the goalie, and you take a chance on Robin Lehner, how that would have gone yeah. over in, in those markets? But these guys, they they had incredible conviction. They built this team, so it's it's an elite team, and and the Golden Knights were far far better than than the Florida Panthers. In the end, Florida was probably lucky to get a game because they got outplayed in the game that they did win. It's a long way to go for the Canucks to get to that level. But you know, if you if you look if you if they're trying to get to that level next season, it's hopeless. If they're trying to get to that level in the next two or three years. It's probably hopeless, but they don't need to get to that level next season. What they need to get to the level is, you know, the Florida Panthers. Be a, be a mm-hmm. team that mm-hmm. got, you know, well, Florida got in, I think, with 92 or 93 points. That won't be enough in the West. But be a team that can get 96, 98 points, get some playoff experience, and then and then continue to build. And and I, I think the, you know, with hindsight, it's, it's clearer, although it was – pretty obvious some of the mistakes that Benning made, you know, especially in free agency. But it's clearer with hindsight that the organization constantly was trying to take three steps at a time when they just needed to take a step and then take another step after that instead of trying to make this giant leap. I think and I hope this regime right now with Rutherford and Alvin realize they they just need one step at a time. So take a step next season whatever that looks like, but make the team better. Take another step the year after that. And who knows, in three or four years, you know, maybe they are in a position to challenge for a Stanley Cup. But right now, they're a long way away. And, you know, we were just talking about the defense. Sorry, I go on and on and on. Oh, no. The segment's over in three questions because I talk so much. But we, we got all the time talking. for you. The show ends at right. noon, Ian, just to let you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we got yeah. time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me clear my throat. Um, we were talking about the Canucks defense, and that's that's the biggest difference. When you look at when you look at a team like Vegas and and their defense, and it reminded me of something that Rick Tockett said when when the Golden Knights were through here. I think it was in February, maybe it was March. It was in March. Yep, it was March, and and he said they were the, the that was the template to him. That was the best defense in the NHL. And when you actually watch it more closely, you know, because teams come in once a year, and, uh, unless they're in the division, then they come twice. Uh, you you see them, but you don't really find, you know, comb through their lineup and see what makes them successful. Um, that's one of the advantages. You cover Stanley Cup as a neutral, and you're just watching both teams. Mm. You, you actually see how good that defense is. And not just because, yeah, they're big. And yeah, for the most part, they're mobile and all of those guys can make a pass and they will all get up in the play. Maybe Braden McNabb, not so much, but they'll all get up in the play. But it's how they play in their own zone as well. It's how they protect the front of the net. And Bruce Cassidy probably doesn't get enough credit for what he did to change how the Golden Knights played. But they're they're two defensemen. They just stay in front of the net. And no matter which two it is, they're going to be big. They're going to be strong. They don't let the other team get to the front of the net. They don't give up second chance chances. It puts a lot of onus on the center defensively to go basically cover both sides uh, of the slot and go behind the net if he has to. But their defense is really good. And I I think that's the model. Everyone talks about a copycat league. That's the model I think all teams, including the Canucks, should be looking at is what Vegas does on their defense. Anything else? <laughs> no, I'm good. What's next? Well, listen, no, that wasn't meant to be. Look, we get people on this show, and they don't have anything to say. You've got it, uh, all sorts of stuff to say, and we appreciate it. By the way, great photography down there in uh, Nevada. I love your pictures. On, on Twitter. It's like Thanks. field trip day. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> you know, I was going to be a photographer early in my career. Was I really? writing, writing or photography, and I... I chose writing, foolishly thinking there was a future to it. So. Yeah. But thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I haven't been on many of these shows for two months, so that's partly why I've got <laughs> things I've got things to say. Plus, I've had three cups of coffee. There you go. There Perfect. you go. Perfect. You made up for it today. Ian, we'll get you back. Thanks so much. Great call. See you guys. Thanks. Ian Thank McIntyre.